Evening friends, <clears throat> Immortality Quest finally unraveled. And I would suggest that there are not many people trying to look for immortality. That people have tended to, in this day and age, accept that their lot in life is the one they have right now. But there's no escape in the reality of death. And when it comes suddenly, perhaps as a result of an accident, or a heart attack, or we the survivors are inevitably shaken by what has happened. Sometimes someone takes a longer time to die when they have cancer or kidney failure. And some events are so common that we all know someone or are close to someone or related to someone that experiences these illnesses. And then we become overwhelmed by the sense of our own helplessness because we cannot reverse what has happened. Because all human resources are powerless to restore a dead person to life. And of course the grieving relative is not easily comforted. You know, the young don't treat death that seriously. When they get to the occasional shock, a friend is killed in a road accident, for example, they, they just say it's bad luck. And the tragedy is soon forgotten. The middle aged do not care to even think about death. It's too far for them to... <coughs> Too far off in the future to be a real danger. And I've heard people at places that I've worked saying, better face it when it comes. And then older people become more aware that there's a reality that they cannot escape. Their friends and relatives pass off the scene. Their eyesight fails, their hearing goes. Their physical ailments increase. And they are reminded that the human frame eventually perishes. And yet I think deep down everyone would find comfort in the idea of survival. Of course we have that phrase, the soul. This mysterious inner life called the soul. And the general population and those that are religious in the world would understand that to have a, a thing. This thing that passes out of the perishing body and it goes to heaven. And where that personality of that person that has died continues to live on forever in bliss. And this view is not so confident, confidently and widely held as once it was when I was younger. It is now perhaps more pious hope than a, a strong conviction of those that claim to be religious. And the view which used to be held as a necessary counterpart, which was that these souls of evil people go to hell and there they suffer torments. It's now generally abandoned by religions. Except for, of course, the Catholic Church, which maintains belief in hell, purgatory, limbo, paradise. And of course this is to control the people that follow that religion. By threatening them with all those things if they do not do what they say is right. And there must be said that there's a general lack of reason in the popular attitude here. Because if the souls of the righteous go to heaven, where do the souls of the wicked go when they go <laughs> off to hell? Well... An increasingly number of people today are just frankly pessimistic. They accept that death is the end of life. As someone I knew years ago used to say this, I'll soon be pushing up daisies. And of course this view has unfortunate consequences because when you start thinking like that and give up that this is it, the life we have now is it, the only life we're going to have, we begin to argue that we can do what we want, we can do as we please, we might as well, to use a Bible phrase, eat, drink and be merry, because tomorrow we're going to die. Well, this view of life has a serious effect on the type of life that people will live. It becomes self-indulgent and self-centered, with disastrous results for society, as indeed we are seeing today. Well, how do we settle this question about what happens after death, friends? Where would we go to for a, a thoroughly reliable and truthful answer? Well, sometimes we, out in the religious, the, in Christianity, we would go to the, the leaders of that church. and Because we know that to trust our own feelings or our intuition might not be an exact science. But we don't know who's really right. And how can we expect anyone else to accept our view with our own authority? How can any man or woman anywhere tell us the answer? And so people tend to go to the religious leaders. They might go to individuals or they might go to councils or synods and 
we might ask ourselves, how do they know what the answer is? And what are we to think when prominent religious leaders in one particular sect as such are seen to be divided amongst themselves on important issues? One prominent bishop a few years ago declared that Christ did not literally rise from the dead. He, he rose as an, an apparition of some sort. And yet others in that same religion declared the resurrection to be one of the foundations of the Christian faith. And so we have to ask ourselves, who do we believe and why would we believe them? And these questions, when sincerely faced, lead us to this conclusion that the opinion of the human mind of itself is of no more value than of any other. In other words, human thinking cannot give us the answer. And from this very important conclusion emerges that since no human mind can produce with authority on what happens after death, then clearly we need an authority coming from outside and above mankind. And that authority has to be a superhuman authority. And that authority has had the pages of scripture which you might have in front of you written. And that authority would be God and his word, the Bible. And from first, right in the beginning to last, declares that it is a message to the human race from God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and of all mankind. So many times the Bible writers, they've never claimed to speak on their own authority. They use phrases such, the word of the Lord. I have had words put in my mouth. Indeed, that was what was said of God by the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord Jesus accepted the writings of the laws and the prophets, which of course came from the Old Testament as the word of God. And he himself declared that the words he spoke were God's words. The apostles declared the same thing. Paul declared that all scripture is inspired of God. And he uses a term which means God breathed. The breath or the spirit of God in what is written. And so we can trust that what the scriptures say is truth. And the earlier believers in Christ, from those who knew the apostles personally, accepted the Old and the New Testaments as the true and reliable word of God. And so for centuries, the teaching of the Bible has been the foundation for Christian belief. And we have to think about what the Bible actually does. One of the things, it is, it's a record. It shows how the human race came into being. It explains in clear terms, right through the pages, Old and New Testament, why there's evil, suffering and death in the world. It tells us positively what happens after death. It also reveals a new kind of life which can be ours if we will only pay attention to its message. There's no other book in the world which does this. In fact, there's no book anywhere which shows so many signs of being produced, not by human minds, but by the mind of God. About 120, 130 years ago, a man called Henry Rogers wrote a book. The book's title was The Superhuman Origin of the Bible Deduced from Itself. And he declared... Quite a few places, but this sentence stuck out. The Bible is not such a book as man would have written if he could, nor could have written if he would. And the reason is because it is a message from God. And that is why it deserves <coughs> our sincere attention. It is important that we must understand what the Bible has to say about us, about our origin and our nature. It's the only authoritative account anywhere of how we as mankind came to exist. The book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, is about our origin. It tells us clearly that man was a created being. That is, he depended upon a creator for his very life. He was not responsible for his own origin. And in one sentence, I'll give it to you. This is how it happened. Genesis 2 verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. Simple. Man's lowly origin, friends, was from the ground, from the dust of the earth. And yet Genesis tells us in chapter 6, verse 17 and 7, verse 21, that animals, too, share the same breath of life. And it's something that we should understand. It is the expression, a living soul, which should get our attention. 
and will teach us that the first and essential condition for understanding the Bible, that we must understand the Bible in its own sense and not in ours. And now too many people, as I began this evening, think that the soul suggests some spirit within man which survives the death of the body. But that's not how it's used in Genesis in the Hebrew. The word translated soul is used of animals as well. So Genesis 1 verse 21 and 24 translates it as living creature. The Revised Standard Version translates soul as living being. And so does a New International Version. The New English Bible has a living creature. And so the conclusion is clear that Genesis is telling us by origin and nature man was created a living being. <clears throat> of course we all know we have greater powers than that of animals. But basically our nature is the same as theirs. And then when we come to what this talk is about tonight, that when man's life might come to an end, well, that's treated once again very early in Genesis. Adam was told by God if he disobeyed the commandment he had received, he would die. He did disobey, and this is a judgment which was pronounced upon him. It reinforces that phrase I've just used from 2 verse 7 about man being formed of the dust of the ground. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And so, friends, it's devastatingly simple. Death is not a door opening to a new life. Death is a judgment for disobedience. Man returns to the ground. So in the Genesis record of the flood, when the earth was corrupt before God and filled with violence, it says that all flesh had corrupted his, that is, God's way upon the earth. The waters of judgment came and men and animals perished in the same way. In Genesis 7 verse 21 states, All flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, of cattle, of beast, of every man. All in whose nostrils was a breath of life died. You know that the Bible frequently compares the nature of man to that in animals. And in Psalm 104, verse 29, it states, Thou, that is God, taketh away their breath. They die and return to the dust. And the writer of Ecclesiastes is also quite categorical. And he desires that men should see in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 19, that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men, befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, all go to one place, all are of dust, and all turn to dust again. And so men and animals have by nature the same fate, in that they return to the ground. You know, the word spirit the very same as rendered the, as the word breath. And it shows, as we've seen, that the soul indeed would die. The soul can die. Because the psalm is speaking of the judgment that God brought upon the Egyptians with the ten plagues. It says that he, God, spared not their soul from death. And then immediately adds, and gave their life over to the pestilence. Saying that the soul, showing that the soul and the life are the very same thing. Twice God declared through the prophet Ezekiel, the soul that sinneth it shall die, in Ezekiel 18 verse 3 and in verse 20. Samson, that strong man, in his final appeal to God when he brings down that, that temple of idols upon the Philistines says, let me die with the Philistines, in Judges 16, verse 30. And if you go into the margin of most uh, Bibles, King James Version particularly, in the margin will show that where it says, let me die with the Philistines, Samson said in the Hebrew, let my soul die. And so friends, I'm sure by now you can understand and perhaps accept that the soul then is the person, the living being. When we perish, the soul or the life perishes with us. Well, does this mean that we know better than the angels? 
No, because Genesis 1 verse 26 tells us that man was created in the image of God. What Basically what that means is the physical nature of mankind is just like that of the animals. But man has a superior mind capable of understanding and responding to God. And the psalmist in Psalm 49 verse 20 states that man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. Sadly, that describes most of the world out there today. If they do not understand what God would have them do to please Him, no matter how high their status in life may be, no matter how low, if they do not understand and want to understand the Word of God, to understand God Himself, they're just like animals that die. And so we see that the main difference here is, it is the understanding that makes the difference between man and animals. Well, we might ask ourselves, understanding what? Well, we soon to come to portions from the New Testament. We'll see that explained better. So in view of the Bible evidence so far reviewed, it's no surprise to learn that the dead rest, completely unconscious in the grave. Do not trust in princes or men, says the psalmist in Psalm 146 verse 4, because his breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. David prays that God will deliver him, for in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave, who shall give thee thanks, in Psalm 6 verse 5. And then in verse 17 of Psalm 115, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Ecclesiastes again. Chapter 9, verse 5 to 10. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You know, Daniel, in the Old Testament has a remarkable statement on this subject of death, and he actually refers to it as a sleep. It's especially significant because of the use made of the same idea in the New Testament. And his prophecy in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he's referring to events in the last days, which is pretty much where we are now in 2017, because we as Christadelphians believe that the return of Christ is that near. When God will show his power once more on the earth as a, in a time of trouble such as never was. Daniel 12 verse 1 it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And this statement refers to that part of the faithful servants of God is clear from the assurance that they will receive everlasting life through God's grace. But look where they are up until they receive this reward, friends. They sleep in the dust of the earth. And it's a testimony entirely consistent with all that we've seen so far. Well, I've been quoting extensively from the Old Testament. We'll now go to the New. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ reinforced in everything that he said when he referred to things to deal with the Old Testament. The attitude of our Lord Jesus and the apostles after him. Their reaction and their attitude to the writings known as the Old Testament. Well, they all accepted the law, the Psalms and the prophets as inspired word of God. And they quoted extensively from them so many times. They never once contradict or cast any doubt upon any New Testament passage. But rather seek to draw out the true significance of what was written. You would thus expect the New Testament writings to agree 100% in their teaching with the old. And so it proves. Now, there was an example given in Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to 31. And I'll just take a portion out of it. There was a tragedy in Galilee and the Roman soldiers had killed a number of Jews in a religious riot. And some of these Jews came to the Lord Jesus Christ to ask him what he thought of it. <clears throat> And his response is very significant. 
Do you think, he asked, that those Galileans who died were greater sinners than all the other inhabitants of Galilee because they suffered such a fate? Not at all, he said. Ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. And that's what that word, it's, it's an old word, it's an old English word, but perish means exactly what it means now as it did then. It means to cease to exist with no suggestion of survival. None at all. There's no escaping the teaching of the Lord Jesus here. All man will kind will perish unless they repent. As Psalm 79 told us that man is like the beast that perish unless he understands. Well, here we come to that phrase about the, having a first hint of the answer to our question, to understand what. And it's something to do with repentance. The Lord Jesus agreed with Daniel as well, who declared that many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake from Daniel 12. And in the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus Christ says in John chapter 5, verse 28, The hour is coming in which all that are in the tombs shall hear his, that is, Jesus' voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. And just by, and I know it's in a different language, but the, where the, the Lord Jesus Christ uses the phrase all, it's exactly the same meaning as the word that Daniel uses of many. And so it refers to all those who during their lifetime have heard the voice of the Son of God. Well, we look where the dead are. They're in the tombs. They're sleeping in the dust of the earth, as we see in Daniel. They come forth by resurrection. They awake. They come forth either to life or to judgment. And the harmony between the Lord Jesus and Daniel is complete. Because the Lord Jesus Christ endorses a teaching of what Daniel says in the Old Testament. It's an important matter of the place, the state, and the fate of the dead. Now there's a phrase which is used so many times by the religious churches out there the, who fall under the, the blanket of Christianity, or so-called Christianity. And the apostles uphold the same teaching as the Lord Jesus Christ, and this phrase which is used so many times is the one in John 3 verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so there's no escaping the, the verdict that those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the way that the scriptures explain, will perish and cease to exist. No hope of survival. So the Apostle Paul is the same message. When he writes to the believers in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Without Christ having no hope, and without God in the world, his people would perish. It tells us clearly that if we are not related to God through Christ in the way that he requires on his terms, then we are without hope. And how precious must that understanding be that can save us from such a state? Even James, the Apostle James, tells us that his readers are not to make too confident assertions as to what they shall do at some certain time. In fact, when you hear Christadelphians talking amongst one another when they talk about what they're going to be, do, be doing in the near future, they use a phrase, sort of almost ending all their sentences, God willing. And we'll take... A bit of study to understand why it's so important to say those words. But it is only through God's will that we can do things. And James says here in James chapter 4, I'm reading in the Revised Version, <clears throat> What is your life? For ye are a vapour that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. The NRV says, You are a mist that appears and then vanishes. Well, the Apostle Paul, again, writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
obviously meaning those that have died and are awaiting the return of Christ for resurrection. That ye sorrow not, even as the rest who have no hope. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. So once again we see that the faithful believers who have died and are asleep are to be resurrected. Those who do not believe have no hope. And so they will not be resurrected. And Christ himself will descend from heaven and the faithful dead will rise from the grave. Now these are basic teachings in the New Testament. They are foundation truths of the gospel. Well, we, we're speaking about resurrection. We'll, we might find it hard to, for those who believe in survival after death of by some immortal soul or spirit to explain why the New Testament lays such great emphasis upon the resurrection of the dead. And that it does so is not without um, any discussion. It is beyond question. The Lord Jesus Christ assumes that everyone knows that the resurrection is true. And he, in telling the Jews not merely to invite their rich neighbours to a banquet, hoping to get a return invitation, but to invite those in need, he says in Luke chapter 14 and verse 14, that they should not do these things, be kind to someone else, hoping to get it paid back, as it were, that thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So we do things because we know that they are right. We do good things to our neighbor because we know that God would like us to do that and we would please him. But we are not to do it for reward. The faithful dead are to be raised from the grave, and that is when they receive their reward, friends. Now the Apostle Paul devotes a whole chapter to the subject of resurrection. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this asserts that the dead will rise, and he makes a special point of arguing that if Christ did not rise from the dead, then no one else can either. And in that case, he says... In verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 15, They also which are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And note the implication here. If in this case even the believers in Christ have perished, how much more those who have not believed? And there's no doubt about it, says Paul. Christ did rise from the dead. In fact, if you go through the pages of Scripture, you will find in the New Testament how many actual witnesses there were to his life after death, as it were. And so Christ has become the first fruits of them that sleep. He's been resurrected. We are assured that we will be resurrected if we believe. Well, in this phrase, the, in the phrases used in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, twice within three, you, three verses, describes the dead as asleep. And such is his agreement once again with the Old Testament, with Daniel. In the remainder of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul declares for the faithful, dead there is to be after the resurrection a change of nature. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, our present nature is mortal and corruptible. And that's why we started off by saying, what happens when we die? How do we feel? We might have confusing ideas if we don't understand the Bible as to what happens to you. But most people understand, even those who have never read the Bible would understand that our present nature is mortal and corruptible. But now, Paul tells us that when the dead are raised, they are to be changed. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50 it says, This corruptible, as we are now, must put on incorruption... And this mortal, as we are now, must put on immortality. And this is the way that death is swallowed up in victory. And so we arrive at that clear Bible truth that the reward of the righteous does not consist of some spirit existence somewhere. It's the granting of an incorruptible body, one that will never waste away, one that will never perish as our present one does, and will no longer sub be subject to death. And the reason is remarkable, because God has a work for the faithful to do in that future to come. 
Those who have been granted resurrection from the grave will move about the world as real, tangible people, engage in the practical task of enlightening the nations of the world and the truths of God. I'm just going to touch very quickly, just as an aside, it's connected, but just as an aside. There's some places where we read in, in the Word of God where we might think that, and someone suggested this to me many years ago, there are some passages in the New Testament which support the idea of survival after death. And of course, they, you, you cannot help but be, talk about the subject of hell. In the Old Testament, the word hell is translated um, as, as it is written in, as the word hell, is no more than a concealed or covered place. So it's the grave. It's translated as hell 31 times in the Old Testament. It's also mentioned grave 31 times. And an example would be in a Genesis 37 verse 35, when Jacob mourns the loss of his son Joseph, who he thinks has died. I will go down into the grave to my son mourning. It's the same word used elsewhere as hell. In Psalm 6 verse 5, In the grave who shall give thee God thanks? Ecclesiastes 9, There is no work nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And then the prophecy in Psalm 16 verse 10 says, Talking about this prophecy of Christ, Thou, that is God, will not leave my soul in hell. Which should have actually said the word grave. And it quite simply means that God will not leave his life for himself in the grave. And then it says, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ was in the grave three days before he was resurrected. Just as an aside, if people talk about this great fearful place called hell, I've actually heard in the media people use the word God and Jesus Christ is a, in blasphemous terms with no correction or censorship. But the moment that someone uses the word hell, the whole studio goes quiet when the person suddenly realizes they've said some terrible, awful, awful word. And I've said to people, if you want to understand what hell is, the next time you bury someone, look down into the hole where their coffin goes, you're looking into the gateway of hell. That's all it is. It's a grave. It's a covered place. The other word is Gehenna. In the New Testament, this is phrase, it's also the, the word hell or grave. And it's called Gehenna. And the best explanation I could find comes from Grimm's Thayer's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. And it says that Gehenna, this valley of lamentation, is the name of a valley to the south and east of Jerusalem, so called from the crowns of little children thrown to the fiery arms of this idol Moloch was an idol having the form of a bull. The Jews so abhorred the place after those horrible sacrifices that had been abolished by King Josiah in 2 Kings 23, that they cast into it not only all manner of refuse, but even the dead bodies of animals and of unburied criminals who had been executed. Since fires were always needed to consume the bodies, that the air might not become tainted by the purification, it came to, the place, it came to pass that the place was called Gehenna of Fire. And so when you have phrases which have been translated by the translators where they talk about this, this eternal immortal fire, it's referring to that. And in fact, Gehenna is used 12 times in the New Testament, 11 of them by the Lord Jesus himself. I'll give you just one. He talks in Mark chapter 9, verse 43, he talks about us sinning. And if we do something that we, when we sin, if we should try not to, by thinking if we do that action again that caused the same sin, don't do it. And one of the things that we find today in our age is that one of the big causes of problems is a lack of compassion. The Lord Jesus says in Mark chapter 9 verse 43, If thine eye offend thee, which is to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. At word Gehenna, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And I suggest you go to read that whole passage in Mark chapter 9, verse 43 to 48. And basically, if you understand from that Grim Thayer's lexicon, you'll understand why people then would have known that this fire just kept on burning with all the refuge that was thrown in. 
Basically what the Lord Jesus was saying, if there's anything you're doing with your hand or anywhere you're walking with your feet, anything you're seeing with your eyes, which is preventing you from entering the kingdom of God, then stop doing it, even if it requires that you should remove that offending part of your body. I'm sure that we would think of another way to do that without having to chop off our hand or remove our, our eye. Now the soul. The Old Testament passages we've already considered, we understand the soul means the person and his life. It can sin and it does die. It's used in the New Testament about a hundred times. It's soul 58 times, life 40, and mind 3. And one of the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ used in Matthew 16, he says, dealing with this word soul, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For if a man, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, friends, in that Sing those verses, Matthew 16, verse 25 and 26. The word life and life and then soul and soul, exactly the same word. And even in, if you go to revised versions of the King James Version and the revised standard versions, it translate that word life in all four of those occasions. This is one of those sections in people's understanding as to what will happen in the future. And when, when people read the Word of God, some of them, they will just read through this passage and be touched by it in some way and continue with it, not really understanding what it means. And it's one of the things that really I battled to understand when I first became Christadelphian. And that was the part in Luke chapter 23, verse 39 to 43, where it talks about the thief on the cross. When the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, he had a thief on either side of him. So we have the Lord Jesus hanging on the cross, perhaps the centre one. Two thieves. And the one criticises the Lord Jesus Christ and begs him to save himself. To save this man. But the other man says, we are justly condemned. This man has done nothing amiss. This Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't say that word, but this man has done nothing amiss. And then he turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And there's a few words there. You know that this man must have had some connection with the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. He might have been one of his faithful followers. Because I've just taken four things here. He knew that this man was Lord, referred to as Lord. That the thief expected that the Lord Jesus Christ would survive the crucifixion at a later stage, obviously. He understood that at some future time, the Lord Jesus would be coming into his kingdom. So he knew that he was a future king. And he knew that sometime the Lord Jesus Christ, if he wanted to, he could actually remember this thief and restore him to life. Now, his answer to this man, even though it's in English, basically was, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now if you read it to the King James Version, it actually reads as, Verily I say unto thee, comma, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The problem is, is that when you read Greek, it's actually written in capital letters, there's no punctuation, there's the beginning of the sentence, and then there's a full stop. So the phrase that he said to him would be effectively, and I could write it on the board there, but you'd understand it. He would say in one word, Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So you could actually place the comma where you want to. The translators chose to place it after the fifth word, Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But if we look at it as, Verily I say unto thee, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I'll explain that. It makes all the difference in the understanding of this promise, because it was a promise. Grammatically, either sense is possible, friends. The word today in Greek is simeron. It may be taken either with the first verb or the second. Well, if we understand that in Deuteronomy 4, 
It was a familiar Hebrew form of statement. And there's three examples from Deuteronomy 4, verse 26, verse 39, and verse 40. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. Now that doesn't mean that heaven and earth witnessed against that person or group of people on that very day. It was, I'm um, making the statement today. Verse 39. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart. Same reasoning. And then in verse 40. Thou shalt keep God's commandments, which I command thee this day. Now you say, well, if you commanded the commandments that day, do you only keep them that day? Or do you listen to them today because you've been commanded to do them, and then you do them forever after? And so to declare something this day or today was a form of solemn statement with a full assurance of truth. And there are 42, time, 42 occurrences, 42 times of this type of grammar where the word today is used as such. And so the Lord Jesus was using a well-known Hebrew form to underline the seriousness of his words. I say unto thee today. And so the thief would have been assured that what the Lord Jesus Christ had promised would indeed come to pass. But what we've got to understand as well, which reinforces it, is that if the Lord Jesus Christ said to him, you'll be in paradise with me today, well, no, he wouldn't. He would have been in the tomb with the Lord Jesus Christ for three days in that hole in the ground with a door that was slid closed and sealed, which would have made him a liar. He tells him in Matthew 14, verse 20, the Lord Jesus Christ says, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the word heart is a Hebrew idiom for midst. He meant that he would be in the grave. In fact, we would actually use it to say today um, to get to the heart of the matter, is to get to the center of the matter. The word paradise. I say unto thee today, I shall be with me in paradise. We have to be very careful about, to get our understanding from the Bible itself, not from human traditions. The word was originally used in Persian, in Persia and in the Old Testament, and it's translated, the word paradise is translated forest, orchards, and gardens. Isaiah declares in Isaiah 51 verse 3, that when the time comes for the Lord to comfort Zion, he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. And so the Greek translators of the Old Testament, which would have been around about 200 years before the Lord Jesus Christ lived, they rendered the Hebrew garden, the phrase garden here, Paradisos. And that's the word that the Lord Jesus Christ used in the Greek to his in his reply to the thief. And so paradise stands in the Bible here for a new kingdom of peace and joy which Christ will establish when he returns to the earth, when he comes in his kingdom, as the thief indeed believed he would. And thus understood we know for sure that the passage owes nothing to Greek legends but it's quite consistent with the teaching of the whole Bible. Well, friends, the question might be asked, even having heard all this tonight, if the survival of some soul or spirit is not taught in the Bible, not taught as the fact that the soul or spirit after death survives, why has it become so widely believed by so many people, especially those who call themselves Christians? Well, the explanation is quite simple. The idea of survival was common in all pagan religions of antiquity and all nations. I work with Buddhists who hope that they don't come back as a grasshopper, come back as a more noble animal or a more noble person. That would be their understanding of what happens to them. It represents a common longing of the human mind. The older you get, the more you want to live. And it was a distinctive mark of early Christianity that rejected this false belief. The first Christians understood the perishing nature of mankind. They looked for a new life. It was promised through the gospel, but it wasn't promised at death. It was promised at the return of Christ when the faithful dead would rise from their graves, as we have, as we have considered this night. As time went on, however, mass conversions of formerly pagan nations occurred in the Roman world. And inevitably, many converts brought their pagan notions with them. And further, the leaders of the Christian church try to make their teaching harmonize with ideas of the philosophers derived from Greek sources. And the immortality of the soul was common among them. 
just as an aside, Christmas, Easter, etc. was also introduced, which were pagan festivals. And what better way to get a convert just before December the 25th by to tell him you're actually going to be getting a present on this day. And this is the reason why it was just taking pagan religions and moulding them into Christianity. But wherever there's been a serious attempt to discover what the Bible is saying, there's also been a return to the beliefs of the early Christians. You know, such a return occurred during the Reformation in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. And the truth has been acknowledged openly in more recent times by distinguished theologians. A man called B.F. Westcott in 1897, he was a professor of divinity at Cambridge. He wrote a book, Some Lessons on the Revised Version of the New Testament, page 192. He had this commentary on 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. It talks about the soul. And he said, the central fact of our creed is not the immortality of the soul, but the resurrection of the body. Our Savior brought life and incorruption, not immortality to light. Bearing his truth in mind, we can see the force of Paul's words, which Paul wrote in Philippians 3. The Lord Jesus shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation. In 1924, Bishop Gore of London wrote, in his book, The Holy Spirit and the Church, page 288, the footnote. I think that in the doctrine of human nature, the proposition that the soul of man is in this essence incorruptible and so necessarily immortal, those are derived from Greek philosophy and not from Scripture. And even during the spread of irreligion during the war years between the first and the so-called, well, the, the First World War and the Second World War. The Church of England set up a commission during the Second World War under the chairmanship of the Bishop of Rochester. And he wrote a report, along with many religious communities, and the report, which was called Towards the Conversion of England, published in 1945, where they were trying to find out, was it the war that was making people irreligious, or was it just mankind decaying? It was a combination of both. <coughs> But the phrase is on page 23. The idea of the inherent indestructibility of the human soul or consciousness owes its origin to Greek and not to Bible sources. The central theme of the New Testament is eternal life, not for anybody and everybody, but for believers in Christ as risen from the dead. And these are remarkable declarations. The phrase, the gospel, it means the good news. And that's why the message of the Bible is called the gospel, because it is good news. 